Hej, hej och välkommen till denna installationsföreläsning som Kentaro Umeki ska hålla i ämnet energiteknik. Jag som är ordförande här idag är Mats Näström och jag är prodekan vid den tekniska fakulteten vid LTU. Installationsföreläsningen, vad är det då? Ja, det är någonting som alla professorer, nya professorer håller då när de, när de har blivit professorer. Och i år kommer de då att motta sitt diplom vid, och installeras vid LTUs akademiska högtid som är då lördagen den 9 november. I år är det totalt 14 nya professorer som ska installeras. Då. Tre kvinnor och elva män. Lite dålig fördelning där, men, men vi får väl se till att få det bättre till nästa år. Installationsföreläsningar har vi för att vi ska lära oss lite om grunderna i ett forskningsområde och även ta del av forskningsfronten. Föreläsning som Kentaro kommer att hålla kommer att ta ungefär 45 minuter. Och det är öppet för frågor efteråt då. Ett par stycken, det beror på vad vi ligger i, i tid då. Kentaro kommer strax att presentera sig själv lite mer. Titeln på presentationen är ett hållbart, energiteknik, äh, ett hållbart energisystem. Vilken roll har tekniken? Kentaro kommer att prata om nya teknikens roll, hur forskningen kan bidra till att utveckla ett hållbart samhälle. Så, Kentaro, the floor is yours. Ja, tack, Mats. Okej. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh... I have to apologize for that I'm going to speak in English today because it's the easiest for me. Probably it's not the easiest for everyone, but that is an um, uh, easy language for me, so I, I will speak in uh, English. Um, so before talking about this, uh, how energy technology, I probably, who am I? I? Probably you might be wondering, so I show a little bit about it my history in the, in the pictures. Uh, I came from this uh, south of Japan in a yellow star called Miyazaki. And this is a picture probably five, ten minutes from my home, as a, my parents' home. And then that is a place I came from. And I studied in Tokyo, uh, Tokyo Institute of Technology from bachelor to, to PhD. And then um, on the way I stayed in Korea, um, Australia, Germany, and Stockholm, and then I ended up here to the north. And uh, probably you wonder why you came here with that kind of beautiful <laughs> play, paradise. But, but I enjoy being here, doing skiing, and, then, and uh, enjoying the activities in, in the in outside. So, so that is. Uh, life at the moment. I play a lot of basketball and things like that. Yeah, but I think enough of me and I start talking about the energy and then what could be the future in the energy. So how, <clears throat> in the beginning I talk a little bit how what is energy and how green are we at the moment and um, what could be the future something that uh, briefly about the technology that we are developing in our, our group in total. And, but then it comes to the question of why do we need the research? Can we just, because this is a technology, so can we just company or industries uh, drive the, the development? But the, what's, a, what's a missing link? And then at the end, I, I would, quite deep into the technology, but the technology itself cannot solve all the problems that we have at the moment. So that is a reminder that I'm going to talk. But um, when we talk about energy nowadays, we have we hear a lot about problem, problem, problem. But I want to start from one um, statement that um, for our entire history, innovation in energy technology has been improving our life. That is a strong statement I want, I want to make. Uh, the, the human history has been the innovation in, in energy technology. And 
for example, we can see the picture in this New York City. And where can we can you see energy? It's a, I would say it's everywhere. You can see in the car that uh, that is using fuel for driving. You can see the street lamp. There is also a small stand over there on the right side corner that probably burns something to produce and make coffee or 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 what is it? Um, cold somehow. <laughs> And then that's, that's probably people see what is energy. But then I also see even more that the, actually not only the one that is used here, but the road itself is made of asphalt. That is actually to produce, uh, to make a paper load, you need energy. And for the car or the street light to be made, there's steel. So, and then that to make steel, you need a lot of energy. So, so, literally, um, energy is everywhere. And then this has been, the, the technology development here has been, the, has been changing the world. And uh, I want to go into one example in the transport sector, how we transport ourselves to other places. And then we see the history of what kind of energy we have been using. And then this is, um, Example in UK, how, what kind of energy we have been using for the, for transporting ourselves, and then you can see, from 1800 to 2010 around that time, but in the beginning you can see the one called provender and wind. What that means? This is the food for the horse and wind for the sailing. So this has been pretty much the entire history, how we transported. But then something happened around 1840, that is the innovation. And steam, uh, steam engine has been invented, and then steam locomotive took over all the, the mode of transport. And then you can see the big blue area that represents coal. And then again, around 1940, something happened. And then this was uh, the invention of internal combustion engine that uh, nowadays everyone has been blaming what the, as the cause of climate change. And this has changed a lot and then they transformed from the collective transport of coal steam locomotive into uh, personal car or even flying nowadays. So, this innovation has been changing how we use the energy and how we, the, the comf comfortableness of our energy. So I hope you, I have been somehow convincing that the energy technology innovation is somehow important and it has to be, it has to continue. But then the question has, is then what we are using at the moment. Is it, this is a little bit of subjective picture. It looks like uh, oil and coal is a bad thing and then the renewable energy is a very good thing. Uh, but uh, have you, could you guess somehow how much of our energy is coming from fossil fuel? How much of energy is coming from renewable energy? Is there anyone who is willing to speak out, except the professional that uh, is sitting around there. <laughs> yes, Margaret? Uh, I'll say 70% from oil and coal and 30% from the one on the right. The right. The world. Yeah, you said 70% is fossil fuel. That's pretty good guess. Uh, now, we have been listening a lot of new technology development, but the world is pretty much filled with use of oil, natural gas, and coal. But then, maybe some of you who are from Sweden might be thinking, yeah, but, yeah, that is world, but uh, what about in, in Sweden? We are doing much better. I think, um, yeah, probably that's correct, in a way, that uh, this is, um, 
the statistic from uh, Swedish Energy Agency that you can see that fossil fuel in Sweden is probably 30% of, of the total primary energy. But really, that could be a question. You see what uh, we saw that this is 30% fossil fuels, but is it really so? Are we, are we contributing more? That's the question. And then there is a graph that uh, I want to show. Um, what we have been emitting as a carbon dioxide or uh, greenhouse gas emission. And there are three lines you can see from 2008 to 2019. And this is uh, three different uh, definition. And the first one is territorial emission, that is, we always talk about. Oh yeah, Sweden has been reducing carbon dioxide emission so much. That is uh, what we see. And then this is exactly what emit in Sweden. And then there is another one, um, the second line from the bottom, that is uh, called production based, that is emitted by Swedish people and Swedish companies. So like if you fly to the foreign countries or the companies are uh, having the production in outside, then that is uh, called production based. And then there is something consumption based uh, emission that is almost as twice as territorial emission. And then this is if you count indirect emission on our consumption. For example, you have this MacBook Pro here that is made in China, and then to produce this one, it has been. Um, this metal is made in China that produces uh, use a lot of coal, and then the electricity that we use during the assembly line is is predominantly made of coal in China, for example. So we we tend to think that oh yeah we are doing really good, but if you think about your consumption, actually this is a quite different figure. But I will come back to this probably 20 minutes later, if, you, if any of you remember that you saw this figure. But I will talk about the territorial, um, territorial emission. So, where do we use energy? So we want to go a little bit deep, in deeper of the energy use. So where do we use energy? Um, there are different places, but first, you can, what you can come up with easily is transport. And then there's a power production or heat production. And you can see, think of industry production and then agriculture. So this is, these are uh, often counted as the four main industries that they in Sweden. And you can see in the Swedish Environmental Agency, um, statistics that the transport sector, industry sector has been, have been emitting quite a lot, and heat and power, agriculture are a bit less, and there's a land use that is a big negative. That is actually because Swedish forest volume has been growing every year, and then that is taking up carbon from the, from the atmosphere. So that is a negative. But then you can see that uh, there are two main parts that we have to tackle. And then when, whenever we think about technology, we always think, okay, how can we make a big difference? And when you think about it, it's always easiest to go to the biggest share. Then 10% of this biggest share will be probably 3%, but if you decrease the carbon dioxide emission from others, for 10%, maybe it doesn't make so much difference. So we always think about the reducing the biggest emitters. And when you think about transport, uh, we have to think, what can we do? And if you, if you read newspapers or watch news, and then you might think, okay, future transport, it's all about electric car. All about electric car. Tesla has made a record sales 
I don't know, the few, oh, one or two weeks ago. But, um, so it has been growing, and you, you, you feel that the, the future is going to be only electric. But then we have to think of something else. Uh, how much volume you need to fly, or long tra transport. Uh, I put this figure because I fly from Copenhagen to Tokyo quite many times, um, because of my birthplace, of course. Uh, and then I calculated from the data that we showed, so that uh, if you have this uh, flight, uh, sorry, airplane, that has this size, what is going to be the fuel that is needed to, to fly. And then this is the visualization volume. So this is the amount of the fuel that you need for, for, the, uh, for flying from Copenhagen to Tokyo. And then I recalculated cali back. If, you, if we need exactly the same amount of energy, how much do we need for the volume for battery? Do you have a guess? Is it going to be smaller? No, bigger? How big? Can you guess? Somehow? It will be something like this. And if you have this volume, and if you try to fill out battery in the, in the airplane, actually it will fill out an entire, entire flight. So it's a little bit tricky to fly with battery. There are a lot of initiatives to make more efficient uh, airplane to, to need, so that we need less energy. But uh, it seems unlikely that uh, that will be in the future quite soon. So why is, it, is that? And then when you think about it, we start thinking about the, the we call it energy density by weight, energy density by volume and how much energy you can store in, a, in one kilogram of battery or one liter of battery. Or, and then you compare with different energy sources and you can see striking difference that the liquid fuel has very high uh, energy density and it's almost 100 times uh, more. So that is why we are using liquid fuel because this is a very convenient source Liquid is easy to transport, easy to store, and then you can store more energy. That is a very important point for the, for the uh, use of energy. And probably you are thinking that the lithium-ion battery, this has been improving and it will be more and more, but the, the rate is quite slow, and in the near future, maybe 10, 20 years um, later, the, the figure looks almost the same probably it will shift a centimeter from this way, but uh, it doesn't change so much. So, when you think about the future of transport, probably it's not only electric sticker, but we also need biofuels. And then this is one of the technologies that we're working on. And then uh, I want to show uh, quickly uh, like I say, introduce what kind of technology we are using. Um, this is a picture I like to use all the time. Uh, this is a wood burning with a with a help of some gas flame. And if I think about the technology that we are using, it's something like this: we put in a compartment, and then you avoid the, the air coming coming in contact with wood. And then what happens here? is that in combustion, we usually use a lot of oxygen in the air to burn into CO2 and, and water, and then we extract heat. That's a thing that we are doing everywhere in the world. And then what we do in the gasification is that we limit the access of oxygen. And then instead of carbon dioxide, we produce carbon monoxide. Instead of water, we produce hydrogen. By doing that, we can uh, convert this energy from the from the trees or wood, something like that, into the chemical energy of gas. And then this has been discovered quite long uh, quite long time ago. And uh, the first gasification was actually around the 1800. 
almost same time as the uh, industrial revolution. And then what they did was that the coal gasification replaced the street lights by um, streets as that people have been using for candles and, and whale oil. That has been the, the prehistory, and then in around the 1800, people started using this uh, coal gasification and then transport this gas throughout the city to light the, um, light the street. And then this transform again, that they're from wave oil to candle to gas. And then nowadays it has been uh, trans. Nowadays we don't use gas to to burn uh, to light your home or street, except for the cozy night, for the night. Right. So the question now is that okay, so can gasification give same impact on transportations and uh, transport sector? So. How can we do it? Can we use, can we drive this car with this gasification technology? We have been there. This is also another, I think my favorite pictures that we use from the old time. Some of you have been there probably, from the audience I can see. Um, in around 1940, people have been driving cars with gas, gas fire behind them. And then you can see that the, the gentleman on the left side is put in the wood, um, wood logs inside the gas fire, and then there is a smoke coming out. And then this ga gas coming out was directly introduced into the, the engine. Um, but I can, I can see a little bit of problem of using this technology in 2019. Probably most of you do. <laughs> First, it is too heavy to put in this one. And the uh, second is that uh, this uh, person who is charging wood is getting a lot of smoke in her face. That actually, unfortunately, includes a lot of carbon monoxide. So probably it is not so safe to do it. So that's, uh, that's why we are developing a lot of technology to, uh, or our colleagues have been developing a lot of technology to produce, uh, instead of, taking only gas, we produce liquid fuel. And then, as a summary, the gasification based biorefinery is converting this biomass using gasification technology to make a syngas, that is the hydrogen and carbon monoxide. And then once you get this gas, we can use, we can produce heat and power by combustion, or use ordinary oil refinery processes to produce biofuels or by chemical. So that is a technology that we are working on, and probably I will come back about this again later. Then what about the industry? Industry is also emitting large amount of carbon dioxide. Um, that is coming from different sources. I intentionally deleted the company's name, but uh, probably you can imagine that uh, there are steel making, there's a cement kilns, and there's a mining company that is using a, a, a quite large amount of coal. And uh, that, is, that is contributing 5 to 10 percent of, of the CO2 emission in the, in the whole Sweden. So we also want to think, can we escape from coal somehow? And then probably you have heard about the initiative called Hybrid. In, uh, that is going on in near Lulio. But then I will talk a little bit different things about it. There is another way to do it as well. And actually we have been there. This is a picture I took in um, uh, Stofosh, Um This is a pile of wood. And then actually we do almost exactly the same thing as, as gasification, but it, this time without any air coming in. Then what you can get is actually you can get charcoal and you can get tar. And in all days, this tar has been used for oil painting for the, for, the, for the boats. And then this charcoal was used for the iron making. And then you can, uh, around this Norbotten area, you can see, see many uh, ruins about this kind of steel making plant. 
And then for your information, if you want to visit some of them, this is a map <laughs> of the places where you can use. And then nowadays, uh, we have a renewed, in, renewed interest uh, about this biocode or biochar uh, to be used in the, in the steel making. And then I'm uh, involved in some of the projects like uh, in, that is trying to use biochar, biocode for the steel making in Poganas or some uh, part of the biochar uh, coal in Ludeo. And then uh, I think this is a very good program. I recommend to listen. One of the audience here has been the main speaker in, uh, in this show. Um, so, I have been talking quite uh, a lot uh, vague about this technology, but so what we can see is that the technology already exists and then technology always, already exists in 19th centuries. Then why do we still need something? And then the thing is that we, people use, tend to think that when technology exists, then directly think that we can use that technology. But this is unfortunate. Unfortunately, no. This is not that simple that we can use. Uh, there are a lot of technical issues. And then you can see the newspapers, and then you have a lot of, of uh, biofuel plant that I discussed a bit, late, uh, a bit before. And you see a lot of, uh, of news about uh, this kind of plant has been built. But then also you, can, you also think, listen, uh, see some news that the, all this kind of plant has been also shutting down or, or lower the, the activities. And then why does it happen? And then there are a lot of, of things that uh, I omitted from this technology uh, introduction, that there are a lot of challenges that exist. And then the, apart from the economic uh, issue, there are things like biomass is very difficult to feed into it. And then there are a lot of tar or soot in Swedish. It's called shara and salt. Those are emitted, and then that usually causes a problem. And then also ash has a uh, cause a problem. And then at the at the moment, whenever uh, I have discussed with some of the colleague in uh, some other country, and then when they build this kind of gasification plant, usually it takes long start that operation between three and five years. And then for the people who are lending money to build this kind of plant, they want to recover money within three to five years. This is a, there is a gap between what we can do, uh, how, how long does it take, and how long do you want to take money back. So there is a challenge like that. Um, and then this is the part that we work quite a lot as a, as a researcher. And then how can we solve this problem? So, on the one side, there is a, uh, engineers or industry, and then on the other side, uh, there is a researchers. I think the reading books is a very good, uh, I can say, representation, this representation of, of researchers. And then this is more or less me. <laughs> and um, what we do, what can we do, is that actually we should not just focusing on the reading books and then solving the um, solving equations, we should focus the research related to the program that is happening in engineering. And also at the same time, we should keep up more to give uh, knowledge-based engineering. So when we get the, the knowledge from, the, from our research, we, sh we can give information so that they can, the industry can use. And then by doing that, probably we can get some good relationship. And uh, so I would like to discuss a little bit about what I'm doing on this issue. So starting from problem-oriented engineering science, what do we do? So I talked about the tar and suit as a problem. And then when we, when we come to this problem, problem is happening in the plant that is 100 meter or one kilometer of this area. But the researchers, we don't go directly there. 
Uh, do we, what do we do is we go down to the scales. And we go down to the reactor that is meter to 10 meters. And then we go down to the more like a particles of the biomass, smaller scale. And then you start looking what is really happening there. What kind of, of physics are there? And what kind of reactions, chemi chemistry are there if you go to the nanometer scale? That's something that we always look into. So this is a part we focus. And then as an example, just because it is a cool images, I will show you some example of high-speed camera, high-speed <laughs> images. And then what you can see here is that if you drop a bunch of, of wood particle, uh, polarized particles, and at a different concentration, what is happening? The left side has a more uh, lower number of particles going, down, going through this area. And then the, on, the, on the right side, we put more pow powders at the same time. And then if you see, see the image, this is a high-speed camera, so the entire image that you are seeing is around 50, sec 50 milliseconds or something like that. And what you can see that on the, left, uh, on the right side has more bright smoke coming out. And this is tar and soot. And you can see that if you put less number of particles in the, in the area at the same time, you actually have less tar or soot formation. And in that kind of thing, you can see if you dig into detail and what is happening. And we can also see, OK, then what's but then what, how shall we do this one? How shall we make it more separated or how shall we do it more compact? And then we start looking into the flow and it doesn't work. Uh, of course the video doesn't work. But uh, we, we can also see some how the flow is structured and how the turbulence and those things are happening. And then at the end of the day, you can come up with some idea or something like this. If you create some kind of, of vortex Thing, something like this, like the vape person used, and then you can actually separate this particle because there are a lot of flow going through, and then if the particle goes through the center, then it will eject, eject into the side, sideways. And then by doing that, what we saw here as like a dense particle, a dense flow, and then very, very dilute flow, we can kind of control what is happening in these burners. But then, that's somehow what we see. But then how can we use this knowledge into actually improving the plant? This is where it gets interesting, because what we saw was somewhere around there, what, we, what happens in micrometer, nanometer, millimeter. But then if you want to change something, investment cost is something like two, 2 billion krona, 20 billion krona, somehow like this. Then if you are a sane person, probably you don't just change because I saw something in high-speed camera in the lab. If you're insane, probably. But if you're sane, you don't do that. So here comes a thing that uh, probably somehow you try to describe what, is, what could happen in a plant by describing everything that is happening in a smaller scale and then make some virtual simulation too. So we can go through, uh, we can predict what could happen and then test that, this theory in a, in a virtual world and then try to go towards a real industry. But then question comes, because we want to simulate something that happens 100 meter, one kilometer of the size, but you want to describe a nanometer or micrometer. Is, that, is it possible? And uh, we can refer to what happened, uh, what has been done in the world. And then this is the, one of the biggest, largest simulation effort in the world, already uh, done in US, uh, United States. And then they spent uh, $25 million to do simulation. And when you see the information, you don't have to read anything about these numbers. 
but when you see the numbers and then when you think about what kind of computational, computational resource we have in Sweden, you can imagine that, okay, we use all the Swedish computation power available, and then to do this one simulation, it takes five months. That's a little bit uh, difficult to do. But then another thing, one more thing you want, I want you to see is that the resolution uh, number, it says 2.5 cent cubic centimeters. That means you are resolving to centimeter level. But what we saw from the previous slides was that we want to resolve a micrometer or nanometer. That means if you want to really solve everything, it takes 10 to the power 27 times more time to solve this simulation. If I say easily, probably more, more complicated. And then also, the, I read the papers that they are publishing, and then the chemistry model is, is still too simple to describe what we are doing, what we are discovering in the world. So, some people say, in my, some, some of my colleagues said, Okento, oh, what you're doing is, is hopeless. <laughs> and, or probably another colleague said, what can you do by just looking at this kind of small stuff? But then, I, I still have a dream to, to describe this, and then to, to use our, what, the, what we see in the lab, laboratory to bring in the, in the, in the reality. So, so to do that, we are actually using some, some technique called math scale simulation, and then I will briefly describe what we do here. So first, what we do is doing the simulation of a very, very tiny scale. So this graph is something like a simulation of one millimeter. By doing this small simulation, you can resolve everything that is happening in micro scale, uh, micrometer, nanometer. And uh, this simulation it takes, it itself takes five days or two weeks, something like that. So it is not that simple, but we do this. And then we use that information. You, you don't have to look at any information about this, but you, using this information we get from the simulation, and then we try to do some theoretical analysis. And then instead of doing this simulation, if we can describe the same phenomena in a single equation, that would be nice, because it, then you can use it in a bigger scale. So that's what we do. We, mo we develop model, and then try to implement into the the bigger simulation. And then by doing repeated, repeat, I can say, again and again we do this kind of, of effort for different uh, physics and chemistry that we observe. And then in the future, maybe 100 years later, we hope that we can describe everything. Maybe a bit earlier. <laughs> so this is what we are doing. And then even though we are talking about the pursuit of sustainable world, as a scientist, what we do is this kind of thing, that we go through, uh, we dig really deep into what is happening in a, in a smaller scale, and try to understand, and then develop some chip to, to industrialize this uh, discovery. But we cannot solve everything, in um, uh, ourselves, and of course, this effort has to match with the industry entrepreneur who is investing and who is developing actually the, the technology. We are just a tiny part, and then the real heroes are them, industries and entrepreneurs. And uh, politicians need the right uh, policies, and then financial sectors needs to have the guts to go investment in the new sectors. And some of the financial sectors have been changing their, their attitude or their investment. But then I want to come back to bigger side. That, uh, but all the things that I'm doing or we, have, we are doing is for 
the world. And then, as I promised, I come back to this figure. So what we have been, what I have been describing, what can we do by technology development is to reduce this territorial uh, emissions. But there is a big, big gap in the actual emission that we, we are um, causing in our activities. So this is something that not only us, but uh, you should also so, thrive on. So that's a, that's a message I want to have. So now it's around 40 minutes, so I'm going to give a take home messages. So first thing that the innovation in energy have changed our lives. I hope that I convinced about it. And fossil fuels are still dominant energy sources. And there is no silver bed. As I, as I describe in transport sector, there is no only electricity, only biofuel. We need everything. Right. And then new technology, and I put new because this is all this technology exists for hundreds of years. So new technology is a must for the sustainable energy. But tech, and then technology already exists. But they have challenges in modernizing. If it is uh, 1900, probably it was, it was okay to have the smoke coming out from gas fire. But now there is, that is not possible. So this is a challenge, the real challenge that we are facing. And the research is ongoing to solve them, but technology itself cannot uh, solve the challenges. So this is a take home message that I want to, want to bring you. And uh, many thanks. I cannot put everyone in this picture, so I just put the nearest colleagues and then the former students. So uh, many thanks to go to them. And then what I talked is I didn't do almost anything. I just took uh, <laughs> took the results from what they are doing. So um, thank you very much. And then. Um, I'm happy to ask you a question. Okay. Yeah. Kentaro, thank you very much for a very nice lecture and interesting also to see and hear about this with energy con consumption and, and so on. We are very pleased at the university to have you as a professor, a new professor, and here's a small gift for, Thank you for that from the university. Thank you. Thank you.